Next we have Nelson Bridwell with his presentation, To Be or Not To Be. Yes, that's the question, right? We all know that. Uh, hi, I'm Nelson Bridwell. I'd like to thank the Mars Society for allowing me to speak today. I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm not an aerospace engineer. I'm not a politician. So please take my presentation with at least one grain of salt. Um, I'm not always right, but most of the time. OK. Um, before I go forward, I'd like to relate a little story about when I was an undergraduate and I was talking to a friend of mine who was a grad student in astronomy. And I said to him one day, we're talking about the universe and about the number of protons in the universe. And I said to him, Stephen, does it ever bother you these numbers are so large that you don't know what to do with them? They're incomprehensible. He said, no. You just take the log of it. And if that number is too large, take the log of that. So uh, we'll be doing a little bit of logging here, OK? So. Um, one of the observations people have made is that manned space exploration happens to be pretty darn expensive. You look at the uh, ISS, um, and there have been various estimates on what the cost is when you add things up with the actual components and the maintenance, and then also the 50 some, 57 shuttle flights to get it up there. I think I've, I've seen estimates that the U.S. spent something like $150 billion on it. Um, and maintenance on it, uh, ongoing operations, I should say, are something like about $3 billion a year. Even though we're using all these wonderful, low-cost, commercial cargo folks providing all those services. So uh, space is pretty darn expensive. How expensive would it be to do a lunar surface program? Is it going to be less expensive or more expensive as, than the ISS? What about a manned mission to Mars? How much is that going to cost? Those are interesting questions. Um, it's pretty expensive. It's it's. It is too expensive for any individual that I know. Um, it's too expensive for just about every corporation out there. You look at American Airlines, I think the total, uh, the capital, uh, the total value of American Airlines, the largest uh, carrier in the US, is something like $15 billion. So they'd come a little bit short if they wanted to build an ISS. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so what happens is basically, um, uh, manned space exploration is pretty much in the domain of governments. And in fact, it's only in the domain of a few governments because if you look at the 193 nations in the world, only three of them have put men in orbit. Um, so uh, so we've, we've got government doing that, but the problem also is that not everyone is wildly enthusiastic about manned space exploration. If you look at rival politicians, there's a phenomenon we've seen since JFK of the presidential legacy assassin. Basically, my opponent, who's president, um, I'm not allowing him to have a legacy of doing something great in space. JFK did it. I don't want whoever it is to, to do that. We've got uh, welfare state advocates who basically feel, um, and, and they've got a rationale for it, which is that basically government shouldn't be spending money on things like this when there are people that need something in the world. We've got small government advocates who basically say, Governments shouldn't be spending money on non-essential services, and they look at just about everything in the world as non-essential. And you could argue that way. Um, we've got the unmanned science lobby, and they're, uh, uh, they're basically saying, we get more bang for the buck if we do an unmanned probe than if we do a manned mission. In fact, they think that astronauts are pretty useless. Um, we've got universities. When Apollo came out, we had universities saying, you can spend all this money on putting a man on the moon. Think what you could do to these universities. You know, we could, we could uh, have 16 more new deans and, and, and six more colleges if, if all this money was spent on us instead. So they were actually against the manned space program back in the 60s. You've got climate alarmists who believe that combustion chambers are evil. Um, you've got utopia perfectionists who say basically we can't go any place until the world is a, is, a, is a heaven on Earth. We've got anti-technologists and tree huggers and things like that. We've got the NASA trolls. Uh, and we've also got our, our friendly conspiracy crackpots who basically will insist that there really are dinosaurs on those pictures of, from Mars of the rocks and things, you know. Anyway, so, so then there's NASA and they have to go before Congress and say, what is the value of NASA? Why are we spending this money? And invariably someone will say because it's there, Americans have always been explorers, stories like that. Someone will say, well, there's spinoffs like WD-40 came off of the Saturn V program. That's true, but most, most American citizens will look at that and say, well, gee, that's an awfully expensive can of, uh, of lubricants. Um, and then there's a pretty good argument that, uh, that uh, we inspire uh, children to do things. Uh, 
There are a lot of people who say, you know, Apollo inspired them, and they went on to do really great things. But then again, I think there are probably an awful lot of school children that have no idea that the ISS is up there right now, even though we're spending $3 billion on that. So, uh, so I'm not sure how, how well that one stands up. I think the best argument for NASA is the technical advances in, in space flight itself, like the PICA heat shielding that they developed that's now being used for SpaceX, the, uh, the fast track engine that they developed that became the first version of the Merlin 1 engine. There are all sorts of technical advances in space and in aeronautics that result as uh, the side effects of the Manned Space Exploration Program. So I've been looking at the big picture, and it's and one thing I noticed is that there's this uh, myopia problem uh, with the space program, which is that we have no, we had no plan for once we got to the moon, what we're going to do. And when we go to Mars, everyone's thinking about how to get to Mars. They're looking at two different ways of doing it. But no one's really saying, okay, we're on Mars now. What are we going to do? Other than a couple people who say, we're going to terraform the whole planet. Uh, and, and that sounds like a very plausible argument to most average taxpayers. <clears throat> we're going to go there to terraform the planet, okay? Um, so there's a lack of long-term strategy. We have an unwillingness to plan 25 to 50 years into the future. No one wants to think about that. People only want to think about immediate gratification in the next 10 years. Uh, consequently, major space investments frequently become dead ends. We do something, we get there, we don't know what to do. And then there's also this other problem, which is the grass is greener problem, or as Monty Python used to say, now for something completely different. Um, as soon as NASA develops some new capability, they abandon it because they look over there and say, well, yes, we can get to the moon, but shouldn't we really be back on low Earth orbit? And so they went and they, they scrapped Apollo Saturn uh, and, and pursued the shuttle. And then later on, uh, not that long ago, we, were, we had the space shuttle, which could do these amazing things. And we said, we're going to scrap it in pursuit of Constellation. So we can go back to the moon and Mars. So what is it? You know, where are we going and why? There's, there's, you know, wherever we are, we don't really believe in what we're doing. And then if, if that's not bad enough, we've got the been there problem. Most recently uh, experienced by President Obama saying, we've been to the moon. We're not going to the moon because we've been there. Well, if that's our rationale, what happens after the first man, first man landing on Mars? Yeah, are we going to basically say, well, We've been to Mars. We've been to the moon. There's no place else to go. We're not going to go to Venus. We're not going to go to Mercury. What are we going to do? Alpha Centauri, anyone? So, Houston, you've got a problem. You've got a few problems, okay? So, what it is is a lack of coherence, um, coherence, compelling arguments for, for what we're doing and why we're doing it. So, let's try and come up with some answers. Uh, let's just go back to basics here. We're, we're sitting on planet Earth right now. It's a pretty nice place. Temperature's just about right. We got air to breathe. Drinking water falls from the skies. Food grows on trees. It's pretty nice, you know. Um, um, and part of the, one of the main reasons for that is because there's a star nearby, 93 million miles away, called the sun. And that sun basically is driving all our all life forms on Earth. Um, it's, it's pretty much responsible directly or indirectly for all life and all the other good things in our climate. And the reason that that's happening is because deep inside the sun, in the core, there's a whole bunch of hydrogen that's being turned into helium, and the uh, reduced mass of the result is getting translated into energy, which radiates from the sun and warms us up. Um, there's been a lot of research involved in how the, the uh, heliophysics of the sun works. And one of the things we know now, and also from looking at other stars, is that the sun wasn't always this warm. Back when it was first formed, it was actually about 30% dimmer than it is now, which causes me to wonder every time I hear, I hear someone say, well, Mars used to be much warmer back in the old days. Well, actually, based on physics, it would seem to me that it would have been much colder. But we're going to get to that. And not only is it, uh, was it cooler back then, but it's getting warmer over the course of time. Now, this is a, this is a time scale again. This is the uh, the astronomer time scale over here, we're not talking about years, we're talking about billions of years, okay? But if you look out here to the future, you're gonna see that the sun is gonna actually reach a point on the scale in this time frame about twice as bright as it is now. And so um, that relates to another concept which uh, a lot of astronomers who are dealing with exoplanets uh, have been dealing with, which is the idea of the Goldilocks zone, which is there's a certain distance from a star where it's too hot, a certain distance where it's too cold, and there's a space in between, a, a ring, if you will, called the Goldilocks zones, where it's just right. And 
in the case of our, our planet, uh, it turns out that the Goldilocks zone, this is actually a chart over here showing the blue is the co too cold, the red is too hot, and uh, the white line is where we are right now, and the Earth is that little dashed uh, little box over there going across there. Actually, I think the dash box is, is, it somehow got moved down a smidgen, but it's basically just barely in the Goldilocks zone on the inside side. It's supposed to be from 0.99 up to 1.6 astronomical units, and we're at one right now. Uh, so so things, are, things are good, but uh, things are, are not always going to be that great. For instance, if we look a little bit further right down the road, um, when it's about 6% brighter, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, some geologists basically are telling us that there's going to be a greater weathering going on, and the weathering is going to go and draw the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And when it draws the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, most forms of plant life are basically not going to be able to survive anymore. You're going to wipe out all the trees and all the plants and things like that. There may be some, some bacteria, but basically uh, plants are gone. And when the plants are gone in a short while, oxygen is gone. And so basically, when it's only 6% brighter, goodbye, pretty much all life on Earth. Um, and then, of course, that's not all. I mean, uh, a little bit further right down the road, uh, when it's 10% brighter, they've done some calculations where the, uh, right now, I think our, our main surface temperature is about 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, at this point, when the sun's 10% brighter, the mean temperature will be about 116 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, doesn't sound that too terrible. It sort of like, sounds like Phoenix, you know, on a, <laughs> a, a, a balmy spring day. Um, and, uh, well, actually, at that temperature, what will happen is that the, uh, the evaporation rate of the oceans will dramatically increase. And when the uh, oceans evaporate, all that, all that uh, H2O, when it gets into the upper atmosphere, you'll get photo dissociation, where the hydrogen will separate and it'll escape off into space, and your oxygen will, will come around, but basically you're going to lose all your water. So what's going to happen is that uh, once we hit 10% brighter, uh, the oceans are basically going to be evaporating. So not only don't you have any life, you don't have any water. And then when it gets to about 30% brighter, there's some calculations, which I don't understand, where they're saying we're going to get some run runaway effects possibly related to the CO2 that, what, that isn't there anymore, uh, where it's going to, the temperature on the surface is, is not going to be 116 degrees, it's going to be about 2,400 degrees, which will be warm enough to melt the crust. Okay? So, so there's some things going on here in the too hot region. It's definitely not just right anymore. Um, what I'd also like to mention is that let's look at the, the uh, orbital range of Mars. Mars is more elliptical, and so you're seeing that it's a wider range of astronomical units. But you can see that right now it's actually technically within the so-called Goldilocks zone. And also I should say the Goldilocks zone doesn't guarantee that something is a paradise if you're in the middle of it. It simply says you've got the, you've got the necessary temperatures for liquid water to exist and for maybe life to exist. But there are other factors like do you have an atmosphere? Do you have a magnetic field for your planet? Is that going to be, be able to hold your atmosphere in place? Things like that. So Mars is actually warming up. And as you can see, over the course of the time, when Earth turns into a hell, Mars is going to basically be much less of a frozen uh, waste, wasteland. So, so if you're thinking about long-term investments in Mars and, and buying some property there, uh, it, it's, uh, it may be a promising long-term investment, but probably not in the next, the next 6,000 years. Also, one thing I'll mention over there is that the little, that little yellow dashed line over there is uh, an event that's uh, expected to happen, which is that there's this one of, one of the planets, one of the moons of Mars, Phobos, is actually kind of low, and because of tidal effects, it's actually getting lower and lower and lower every year. Uh, and so they projected that uh, in about 50 million years, which is that, just that little gap over there. This is a long time scale. Uh, this is not... 2024 or 2028, okay? Uh, it's going to reach the Roche limits. Roche limit, where basically the, the uh, gravitational tidal forces from the, from the Mars will actually will pull it apart and break it up, and we'll end up with a ring going around Mars. And that's fine. It'll look pretty, I'm sure. But the problem is that those fragments of the ring aren't going to stay up there forever. We're not sure how long they'll stay up there, but they'll eventually come raining down on the surface. So for some period of time after that, we're going to get sort of a, a late, heavy bombard, late, late heavy bombardment on Mars because of that. And so we might want to do some serious geoengineering because it's only like about 14 miles in diameter. It's not that big. 
maybe we can go and disassemble it and turn it, turn it into something useful or something like that. But anyway, if you look at pictures of, of, of Phobos right now, you can see stretch marks on it because of these tribal effects. It's, it's happening already. So anyway, so we've got this wonderful, wonderful star. And thus far, I was only showing you from there up to here. But something funny starts to happen over here. What happens over here is that we start running out of hydrogen in the core of the sun. The sun's burning through 600 million tons of hydrogen per second. 600 million tons. And it's, in fact, right now, we're already about 50% through the, the hydrogen in the core. So when, it, when this thing starts ha happening, what's going to happen is that the uh, less heat and pressure is built up over there. So the, it'll start to contract, and then it'll heat up some more. And then it will heat up. So the couple things that are going on here, I'm not, again, an astrophysicist, but what's happening is, is that the hydrogen fusion is going to start to move out to the shell instead of just in the core. And then the core, once it gets hot enough, is going to actually get hot enough for helium to, to burn, and you'll get helium flash. And if you look at this graph over here, OK, this is, it's not linear. It's logarithmic, OK? So here we are. And we're, we're at one uh, solar standard sun, solar luminance level over here right now. And this chart is going up to about uh, 10,000, OK? So if you thought it was bad, when the crust melted at 2,400 degrees, uh, it's going to get about 2,000, at least 2,700 times brighter than it is right now. Okay. Uh, so, if you want someplace that's got lots of lots of sun, if you like the sun, or if you're big into solar energy, it's a great place to be, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, also, if you look at this, I'm going to zoom in in the next graph and look at this thing because. There have been people who have said, well, what we'll do is we'll go and get a bunch of big asteroids and whiz them by the Earth and play some games, and we'll move the Earth further out so that it doesn't get so darn hot. And I'm, I'm skeptical. There's, a, there's like a Chinese movie that just came out called The Wandering Earth, which I think that was a premise of it. I haven't seen it. Uh, but uh, I hear those things, and I, it sounds like a dubious proposition in the first place. I love the idea of that. But then, of course, if you're going to move the Earth, do you have to move Mars, too? Do you have to move Jupiter? How do you get these other guys out of the way? Um, anyway, so, so it's going to get pretty darn hot. And this is another ch uh, chart which also has a logarithmic scale. And this is not the, the luminance. This is actually the sun's radius. So the sun is actually becoming a red giant. And the radius of the sun is going to expand by a factor of 250 times or so. It's, gonna, it's been projected that it's going to go out to 1.2 astronomical units. We're at 1. The envelope of it is going to go out to 1.2. So, so will Mars be? Here? Well, will Mercury be here? No. Will Venus be here? Will the Earth be here? We don't know for sure. It's kind of up there. Um, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be basically molten. You know, it's going to be a molten uh, lava, if you will, with some continents of floating metals and things like that. Uh, so it's uh, it's definitely not the place I'd want to go to on vacation. Um, and there's some things going on in, in the dynamics of it. People aren't entirely sure about it. But what's going to happen is that there are going to be all these particles of metals and silicates out in the atmosphere of the sun. And the, uh, the light pressure from all the heat being generated will actually cause them to sort of uh, expand out and leave the sun and drag along some of the, uh, some of the, uh, of the gases along with it. And that, so that's going on. And then you've got changes in the, in, the, in the combustion process with the helium and the hydrogen. And if you can see over here, it's shooting up and down and up and down and up and down. So there ain't no place in the solar system that's going to be comfortable. I mean, because the uh, Goldilocks zone is going to be zipping between Jupiter and Pluto and beyond into the, into the Oort cloud, practically. Um, so it's going to go out to like uh, 95 astronomical units or something like that. And it's going to be doing it overnight. So, so I don't think anyone's going to be doing some uh, car tricks with, with the Earth and, and asteroids. <laughs> Whoops, over here. Uh, come on back here. No, back over there. Come on. Uh, so anyway, uh, that doesn't sound terribly promising like a place you want to be. And then, of course, if that's not bad enough, is that the whole outer 50% of the mass of the sun is going to be released as a shell. And it's going to be flying out at pretty high velocity and high energy uh, um, out all the way throughout the solar system. So if whatever is left there, if there are any people out there 
with lots of, of umbrellas to shield them from the sun and things like that. Um, this thing's going to come through, and it's going to be pretty darn dense. It's going to have the mass equivalent of about 160,000 Earths, okay? And it's going to be spreading out. We don't know fully how symmetric the pattern is going to be, but uh, we're going to be ejecting this out there. So, so we can go off in space, and we can see what we call planetary nebulas, and they look very pretty from the distance, but this is actually sort of a, a midnight ghostly apparition to warn us about our fate. So let's think about this. To be or not to be? A destiny among the stars or extinction? I mean, this place is not going to be the place to be, I don't think. So um, so this is all the, all, the, all the cheerful news. Now let's get to the bad stuff, right? <laughs> no. OK. So the good news is that actually we've got some time. This is the thing. We're talking about millions of years, billions of years, maybe. Um, to get things done, but I mean, obviously, we can't be in the solar system. We might be able to be in Mars for a good while. Um, as far as the Earth goes, all those guys who say carbon taxes and hydrocarbons, that's not going to cut it long term. We're going to have to do some things with the Earth if we want it to be habitable. We're going to have to basically decrease the reflect or increase the reflectivity in the upper atmosphere or something to, uh, to basically cut down on, on the radiation re reaching the ground. Uh, if we want this place to be something that a uh, long term, so that's something that people have to start thinking about. But anyway, we're going to have to get out of the solar system sooner or later, so maybe sooner is a better idea. So what are some of the things that we should be thinking about now? This gives us a context for saying what what are we going to do now? Are we going to Mars? Are we going to the moon? Why? Let's take a look at that. So step number one is basically, I think it's important for everyone, every adult person in the world to understand this is going to happen, okay? And that this is not a laughing matter. If you get if you get on late night television and you say I'm worried about uh, the sun blowing up in, in 12 billion years or, or 7 billion years, they're going to laugh you off the off the off the stage. Um, but in fact, it's no laughing matter at all. Um, and so the other thing also is that we're going to have to get out of the solar system, and it's not going to happen overnight. We don't have starships ready and waiting. Um, so one thing that's also important is that we need. Mankind needs to survive and thrive on this planet for many, many, many years, thousands of years successfully. Um, and so we need to take steps to make sure that we don't uh, do something really stupid. So one, one thing is, you know, again, this is idealistic. I apologize. I'm not a politician. But theoretically, there's no reason why we can't go and screen our leaders, and our military leaders and political leaders and say, are you insane? Raise your hand. Are you uh, irresponsible? Raise your other hand. Are you bold? Uh, are you uh, careless? Are you stupid? And if I mean, I mean, there are there are people out there in the world who are not insane, and who are reasonably responsible, and who can actually go and try and make sure we don't do stupid things. And those should be the people running the situation. And it doesn't necessarily mean someone from one party or another party. I'm saying it's it's complicated. Okay, life is complex. Uh, also, there are these things called bacteria and viruses. And they can do nasty things to us. They could actually wipe out the human race. Um, the, the rate at which communicable diseases, highly contagious diseases, can spread in the world today because of jet travel in a matter of hours. Something could go from one continent to another. Um, there's so much human interaction. There's so, mobil so much mobility. Unlike uh, uh, 200 years ago, where pe people basically spent their entire life in some little hamlet, and uh, you know, travel was within 25 miles or something like that. That's not the case anymore. So there are things that we could do now where we could basically say, okay, we don't have anything right now, but there's no reason why we can't set up quarantine procedures so that people aren't, you know, if, if things, if something bad is detected, we can easily lock down and compartmentalize the problem and minimize the damage as much as possible, or even have people that are segregated totally out of communication with other parts of the population um, to uh, uh, make sure that someone's going to pull through it in the worst of situations. There's also NEO threats. With the NEO threats, we, can, we, can, we should be having telescopes out there to go and look at the skies and find these things. And in addition to finding them, we need to be able to do something about them if there's something bad coming our way. We don't know if there's anything that's really going to happen or not. You know. Some people have said this is why we have to do space is because of the NEO threats. But what if there are to be? 
I mean, there, there'll be things out there, but if, but if, uh, if, if there aren't any that are heading our way for the next 6,000 years, does that mean we're not going to do any space exploration for 6,000 years? No, I don't think that's the, the sole thing. Um, we need to have ways of dealing with these things. So if there is something bad coming our way, if it's a kinetic impactor, if it's small, that's great. If it's something really large, we may need to use uh, thermonuclear weapons to basically deflect the thing or steer it or something like that. If, if you've got a blast that's offset by a couple hundred meters, it's going to vaporize you know, 20% of the, of the asteroid, and that's going to be Newton's law basically propelling it in another direction. So even without scattering it into millions of pieces, you might be able to do some serious steering. Um, you get a lot of energy density off of a thermonuclear weapon, as I think people have discovered in testing. Another thing also is there is no reason why we can't build underground shelters. Again, that's one of those things that people used to laugh about, the idea of someone with a bomb shelter. But in fact, um, the, uh, the mammals survived the KT impact. And they didn't have technology, and they didn't have planning. They just were burrowing animals, and they happened to be underground when the thing hit. Um, there's no reason why we can't have shelters. We, there's no technology required for it so that, so that the worst of asteroids were to hit us. I think we could survive, and the worst of anything that humans could throw at us would also probably be survivable. So, so that's something we could easily do to make sure that the human race doesn't go away anytime soon. And then finally, we need a space program that's aligned with our long-term goals. So one of the things is we need a consistent, a consistent program that's funded uniformly. We don't need 10% of the federal budget going into the space program right now, but we need a, a percentage of it that's focused on long-term goals, and we need that consistently for year after year after year after year. Um, some of the things that we want to do, we won't be able to do or afford right away, but we could do other things, or lots of things we can do now, that will, be, uh, will get us along the way. It's sort of like talking to someone who's fresh out of college about putting money into a 401k for when he's retired. It's a whole lot more effective if you start when you're 25. In fact, Charles Schwab was just saying that 30 is too late to start saving for your retirement. So one of the things that we're going to deal with is we're going to want to go someplace else, and the other planets are not going to be carbon copies of Earth. Uh, they probably won't be green. They um, they may not have an atmosphere that's breathable, uh, and they also may not have uh, gravitational strength that's the same as what we've got. So one of the things we can do is we can say, okay, well, uh, we need to survive someplace elsewhere in, the, uh, in another solar system. We've got some great places to practice that. We can try it on the moon. We can try it on Mars. Um, and in fact, the argument for Mars as being a better place than the moon to, to colonize is true because it's got more resources, but the moon is actually even better in some ways because it's harder. Uh, if you can survive on the moon, you can survive anywhere probably. But I, I think they're both places we want to go. And if we're going to go there, one of the first things we can do is we can say, well, is there going to be any problem with people having long-term exposure to one-third or one-sixteenth? So I think one of the things that we could do that would be cheap and easy and quick would be to put a, a uh, Mars direct style uh, artificial gravity uh, experiment up in low Earth orbit and put some people up there for a couple of years and do lots of things and see how well people can adapt to reduce gravity instead of finding out when you're on Mars. Um, people talk about colonization, but if you can't have children for some crazy reason because of, of the gravitational field, uh, that might put a damper on things like that. So this is something easy to do that's relatively cheap. Another thing we need is we need efficient inter inter interplanetary transportation. Uh, SpaceX has been, done, been doing some really good things. Uh, everyone thinks they invented reusable spacecraft, but NASA was, has been doing that for like 30 years. Uh, the thing is, about it is that they're, they've discovered how to do it cheaply, unlike the shuttle, which was not cheap by any means. Um, we need ways to get large amounts of mass on the moon and Mars and other places. Um, we also need to be able to do ISRU. Uh, we need to be, be able to uh, manufacture materials that we need, uh, air, water, shelter materials, things that are relatively high mass, low sophistication. Um, and also, the thing about this that's nice is that this is, these are things that we could do here on Earth. Is that clock right? That clock is right. Yeah, I'm running out of time real fast. Okay, I didn't realize, so. okay. So, when you do ISRU, 
um, closed loop life support. That's, these are things that we can do here on Earth in laboratories, uh, which is cheap. And we can develop the technology and then prove it out there. Um, we should be uh, surveying nearby exoplanets uh, or stars, uh, check, uh, doing some initial work on hypervelocity transportation. And then also we've got a question, look out there at the stars and decide where we're going because if you're going to spend a couple hundred, you, I'm assuming sublight transportation, so you're talking about hundreds of thousands of years to get there. So you don't want to get there and sky, discover you went to the wrong place. So uh, one of the things you want to look for is look at the stars and say, well, uh, how big is this thing? How long is it going to last? We know that stars that are much smaller than the uh, sun can last for trillions of years, where stars that are much larger actually burn out in a matter of millions of years. So we want to go for something smaller like a red dwarf. Um, we want to stay away from stars that tend to explode, so we want to stay away from large stars that tend to go supernova. Here's a chart showing some of the nearby stars and their masses. Alpha Centauri is nice, but Alpha Centauri A is actually heavier and older than the sun, so it's probably going to go red giant before the, before the sun does, so that may not be the best place to go. But there are other candidates over here. There's even one that's going to be coming in in about 1.4 million years to within less than one light year. So by... We, it may be actually faster to wait before you launch for the star to get closer. Um, and then um, there's this other thing going on in the sky, which is that we've got the Andromeda Galaxy M31. It's heading this way. It's only like about 25 times the distance we are from the center of the galaxy to the, to, to the Andromeda Galaxy. And it's heading our way unlike everything else in the universe. And it's going to merge with us. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you've got these supermassive black holes. You've got maybe hundreds, if not thousands, of globular clusters. And the whole spiral arms are going to be shredded. It's going to turn into a big elliptical mess. And we're not sure if this is a good place for us to be. So another thing is to say, maybe we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. Maybe we want to basically be more distributed around the galaxy. So one of the things we can do is look around. There are certain stars. Everything else is going around in one direction, except there are a couple stars that are out there that have retrograde orbits that go around the opposite direction. There's one called Captain Star, and it's going uh, so basically, you're going 0.2% of the light is, speed of light going the opposite direction. So within about 250 million years, if we went over there, colonized that, and then basically uh, hopped off into other places, uh, we could probably get a dozen places out there um, in 250 million years or something like that. And uh, as far as life goes, uh, you always see the Star Trek thing about going down there, and it's a planet with the people that speak English and, and the green trees and all that stuff. Basically, if you've got biology on that planet, you've also got microorganisms. On Earth, there are one trillion species of microorganisms on the Earth. One trillion. And even though some of those might be harmless because biologies are different, there's pretty high probability that some of them aren't going to be friendly, okay? And it just takes one lousy micro, microorganism to destroy the entire, make a bad day for your, for your colony, okay? So... So it may be best to stay away from anything that's got biology in the first place. Just go for places like Mars and the Moon. And as far as technology goes, I would also say, if someone's got, if someone's biological, they probably got all these survival instincts that evolution gave them. And so there are probably um, risks associated with that. So if we detect someone out there, we should watch them from a safe distance. So today we live in a culture that's pretty overly obsessed with the current moments, and we don't like to think beyond it. Um, why? It, I'll let the sociologists tell you why that's the case. But in any case, I think here's a challenge that could basically require us to seriously think about our future and to take positive steps. And because concrete steps will be taken to ensure that really bad things aren't going to happen, we can rest assured that the story of mankind, unlike the tragedy of Prince Hamlet, will not come to a premature end. Thank you. And I'm over time. Who's the next speaker here? I am at 2.30, I think. Okay, well, we're, we're missing. So I can answer a few questions for a moment if someone yeah, wants to. But um, I don't know I'll have any answers, but if anyone has any questions or comments for a second while we're waiting for the... Yes, sir. <coughs> Excuse me, we're talking about a, a space program aligned to our, our long-term goals. Yes. Who's the hour? Human race. Oh, not U.S. necessarily. Not, not necessarily. Well... It's more complicated than that, but basically there's no reason why we can't go and say, you know, we are human beings, we need to survive. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes, you just had a question? Comment? No? Okay. 
Well, you know, you, you had an excellent point about surviving, uh, you know, a, an asteroid apocalypse. Uh, if you think about it, it's far easier to survive on Earth, the greatest calamity you could imagine, than to try to go to Mars or someplace else to, uh, to survive. Um, you, you now, know, in, the, in the near, near term future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if it, well, hundreds of thousands of years and millions of years, you know. If, well, if well long, long term, what absorbed. we want to do is we want to get to a position where, let's say, 500 years from now, Everything on, on Mars is self-sufficient, and it doesn't depend on Earth. So if the Earth, sure, what kaput, we, we'd be okay. I mean, that's yeah. all idea of the life support and the ISRU. You want to build it up and make it a very, you know, substantial thing that can take care of itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the day after an asteroid hits, you'll still be alive. You'll still, uh, you know, unless you're right in where it hits, uh, life will just get a lot harder. But it'll still be possible for humanity. And many, uh, much of the especially if we prepare for it, especially if we've got shelters, we've got food, we've got plants and things Back like that. Backups, yep. seeds, yes, and yes, yeah, yep. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.